Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever and whenever you are. Uh, this is Dr. Duncan, and this is BI 101, broadcasting to you live from early Sunday morning, five days after Hurricane Sally hit the uh, Florida Panhandle and the Alabama coast. And I'm down at my folks' place trying to help them clean up and some other family and friends. So as I record this lecture, you're going to hear a variety of sounds in the background, lots of birds singing, and then that's going to be replaced with chainsaws and leaf blowers and things like that. So listen in the background, you'll hear a little bit about hurricane recovery. But our mission right now is to talk about evolution, specifically to talk about macroevolution, which is, of course, how species arise, the process of species evolution, and it also involves, uh, over the longer term of geologic time, looking at changes in the numbers of species, which of course involves extinction. So species, the origin of species as well as extinction of species, all part of macroevolution. So uh, by now, you should have mastered the information in our previous class about microevolution, which is about essentially the ways that you can get changes in allele frequency in a population over time. We talked about several mechanisms of microevolution, including natural selection, the big idea that Darwin and Wallace introduced to the world. But we also talked about several other ways that you get change in allele or change in gene frequency over time. So you may want to review that material before you jump into macroevolution because macroevolution is based strongly on an understanding uh, of uh, microevolution. And you'll see as we get started here. All right. So um, let's go from natural selection to how new species arise. I kind of talked all about this so far. Yeah, let's keep moving here. Okay, so one of the first questions we want to tackle here is, what is a species? That's a commonly used word. We use it all the time. Even non-scientists use it all the time. And yet, scientists, because they look so carefully at the world, find that it's not always clear what is a new species. There can be um, very subtle differences between different groups of organisms that live maybe in adjacent areas. And you're not sure if they are the same species or different species. So it can be very complex. Now, in your backyard or your neighborhood or wherever you are, if you go outside, you're going to see a variety of animals and plants. And they're all going to look really relatively distinct from one another if you start looking even moderately carefully. Here's a sampling of common backyard birds in the eastern U.S. And they're all very different looking. Um, but um, the, and, and so what we tend to see is that species that live in the same area tend to be pretty distinguishable from one another okay and that has a lot to do with avoiding competition they've evolved to to avoid competition we've learned how competition has such a big influence on on organisms on their populations so as through evolutionary times species develop traits that help them exploit new resources that other organisms can't support can't can't utilize, that gives them an advantage. So over time, species that live in the same area tend to evolve ways of avoiding competition. Okay, But when you start looking at broader patterns like Darwin did, like Wallace did, like hundreds of other scientists since them have done, you start to see it's a little not so clear as to whether there can, whether when you have multiple species or not, whether the organisms are the same species or different species. And it's also true sometimes at the local scale. And I realize I just switched on here because now I'm going to talk about looking in within one population. We'll come back to comparing species over broader areas in just a minute. But within one population, you can see a lot of variation. Take, for example, this picture to the right. These are all um, snails taken from the same um, forest, mangrove forest, down in the tropics. Now, I'm not a snail expert. Um, if I were to uh, look at that panel of snails, I would probably divide them out into maybe eight or nine, maybe ten different species based on color patterns and so forth. But as it turns out, uh, most biologists believe that all these snails are part of the same population. They're just showing variation in their shell colors. 
um, which is pretty fascinating because that's pretty dramatic uh, variation that you're looking at there. So all this to say that you can have a lot of variation within a population and that can be confusing as to determine when two organisms are the same species or different species, but you also get that variation over broader scales, which I started talking about with, okay? So here we have another panel of organisms. These are snakes. These are garter snakes. They're harmless. Don't worry. No one's going to hurt you. And, um, and this is another example of polymorphism, which I did not define on the previous slide, but it certainly does apply to it. Poly means many. Morph means form. So what we're looking at here with those snails that I showed you, but also these snakes, you're looking at multiple forms of the same species. Now in this case, these garter snakes live in different environments. And so you go from one environment to the next, and you're going to find these, these different forms of the snakes. Again, like the snails, I am not a snake expert. And if I were to see these snakes in the wild, I'd be like, wow, I saw so many different species as I went from this environment to the other environment to the other environment. But a true snake expert would say, uh-uh, stick to birds, Dr. Duncan, because those were all the same species. That was an example of polymorphism. Now, one of the ways we know that this is polymorphism is that um, we've studied the behavior of these animals and whether they can mate with one another, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And also, more modern biologists have looked at their DNA directly and compared the DNA between organisms. But back in the day, back before the science of biology was strongly evolved and before we had genetic technology, biologists would classify organisms into species simply by looking at their bodies, simply by looking at their, um, their, their structure, their form. And that, was, that way of classifying species is called the morphological species concept. You're splitting out species based on how they look. And that led to a lot of what we now realize are dramatic errors in which were different species. In some cases, males and females that looked very different because of, um, because of um, sexual selection or non-random mating that we studied in the previous class. Males and females might look very different, and some of the early biologists thought they were separate species. So morphological species concept, um, it's still in use to some degree, um, but uh, and it was very much the way of classifying species very early on, and that was how we defined species. Um, today, um, a lot of biologists, the more um, the more accepted definition of what a species is is called the biological species concept. Ironically, we we'll abbreviate that as the BSC for short. And it, this was con, um, this was put together this idea by this guy pictured here at the right. This is Ernst Meyer in 1928. I got to meet him when I was in graduate school. He was um, very old at the time, in his 90s, but um, he traveled the world like Wallace did and Darwin did, and he was the one that came up with this concept for how to define what a species is. So let's take a look at that concept. Biological species concept is that species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. Okay, is your head spinning? It's not just you. That's, that is a definition that is packed with information. So let's tear that apart so we can understand it. All right. Species. So we're defining species. And uh, we'd say species are groups of we'll just say groups of populations, okay? And those populations, for them to be a species, they need to actually be interbreeding. That means that uh, males and females from the, the two adjacent populations um, or within the population can actually mate and have offspring, or they have the potential to do that. So they might be on both, they might be separated by a river and they can't cross the river, but if you got them together, they would be able to mate, okay? In either instance, if they could either actually mate and make offspring or potentially mate and make offspring, then we would say that those organisms are, there, are all part of the same species. And we define that they are not part of other species because they can't mate with other species. 
Okay, so let me try to summarize this all more succinctly. Basically, if two organisms can, males and females, for example, can mate with each other and produce viable offspring that survive, then they are of the same species. That is the, um, that's essentially a, a simplified version of the biological species concept. Okay, so we've got two different species concepts so far, the morphological and the biological species concept. Um, we will I will introduce a third concept um, a little bit later, but we need to get through some other stuff first. All right, there's some key points here I'll let you read and digest on your own, and certainly ask about them in class if they don't make sense. Let's now get to evolution, which is macroevolution, and we want to understand the answer to the question, how do new species arise? Okay, so there are many different mechanisms for how new species can arise. There's, um, there's five all total, but we're just going to learn three in this class. Okay, um, Anagenesis, allopatric, and sympatric speciation. Now let me give you an example of anagenesis. So we're going to look at birds, um, not because birds are the best organisms on the planet, which they are, but because this is like a really good diagram for illustrating this. In this instance, we're going to look at um, this graph we're looking at time and time is traveling um, from older times at the bottom of the graph to newer modern times at the top of the graph okay so you'll see like three birds at the very top two of them are ghosted out um, on the far left what you're seeing is a bird with a blue head a green tail and a yellow belly but you go back in time and you see its ancestor had a dark blue head and, and dark blue back instead of the light blue um, uh, back and head. And that's what, and there's some other subtle differences there like the bill color and so forth, okay? So what this is illustrating is that that ancestral bird, and I'm gonna highlight it with my cursor down here, that ancestral bird, just as it adapted to its local environment over time, it gradually shifted in the way it looks. It went from this maybe 100,000 years ago to this up here at the top. Um, in the modern time today. And that transition that you see there does not involve any of the splits and other types of things that we're going to see in just a few minutes. It's just simple changes in, a, in the DNA over time to the degree that you get a new species if you compare the modern species to the old species. These two are so different from each other now many, many hundreds of thousands of generations later that we would consider them separate species. So that's what we call anagenesis. Um, there are, however, um, another group of, another type of speciation is called cladogenesis. And cladogenesis involves splits in populations over time. And we're seeing that on the right-hand side of this graph where you have the same ancestral species with a different um, hypothetical you know circumstance um, over time that that organism gradually changes but at some point at some point the population divides and one branch of the population continues evolving and winds up looking like this and another branch of the population winds up looking like this and these two individuals are up sorry about the the URL thing popping up. Um, these two individuals at the very top are different species. Obviously they're dramatically different looking and that's intentional because they're trying to illustrate that these are separate species, but they share a common ancestor. And that's a key thing about this cladogenesis is that you get more than one species and you have a common ancestor. Okay. Now, we're going to get into the mechanics of this, what can cause the splitting very quickly here, but, um, but so don't give up on me there. We're going to get to that. Okay, we got anagenesis and cladogenesis. One's evolved splitting and to get new species, and one does not. All right, now all forms of cladogenesis involve two steps. The first step is called reproductive isolation. That is when you have a population splits off from the rest of the population somehow and it isn't able to breed with individuals in the rest of the population. 
And that could be for a variety of reasons that we will get into. But suffice it to say for now that reproductive isolation is critical for both forms of cladogenesis because you have to have, if you're going to have a split and go from one ancestral species to two or more um, modern species, then you have to have something preventing those those new lines of species that are emerging, you have to have something preventing them from swapping genes. Because if they can continue reproducing, every time a new trait arises in one population, it'll just spread to the next population. And it would just, then you'd be just looking at anagenesis. So reproductive isolation is critical for keeping the differences between um, these new emerging species, multiple species, to keeping those differences separate. Okay. That's the first step of cladogenesis. The second is that once the populations are reproductively isolated from one another, you're going to get genetic divergence as they adapt to their local uh, conditions. Local conditions meaning, of course, the, both the abiotic environment, you know, the temperature, the rainfall availability, water availability, the foods that are there, the competitors, the predators, the, and also like that includes um, mate selection. That, that includes non-random mating things that are going on. The mates in your environment, your potential mates are part of your environment. So that's all part of the same thing. Okay. All right. With enough genetic divergence over time, you get the emergence of the two species. Okay, that we saw in the previous slide, going back a slide. So enough time has to elapse here with these separate populations for them to accumulate enough genetic mutations to wind up being these very different types of birds that you see here. Okay, two steps of cladogenesis. Let's keep moving. So how do we get reproductive isolation and how does that work? What are the mechanics of that? We have... Uh, different ways that we can get um, reproductive isolation, and we can classify them into two groups. There's prezygotic and postzygotic. Now, both of these terms have a similar root, zygote, um, which refers to the zygote. And perhaps you recall that the zygote is the very first cell that arises when a sperm fertilizes an egg. Okay? Um, so that's what a zygote is. And Prezygotic means that the reproductive isolating mechanism occurs to prevent sperm and egg from ever getting together. Whereas a postzygotic isolating mechanism involves, um, after sperm and egg getting together, um, preventing that, that all, those offspring from further reproducing. And that can, there's lots of different subcategories of this that we're going to look at. Okay, so we got pre- and post-zygotic. So let's go through some examples. The first example is already on this slide. It's a, um, we're going to cover pre-zygotic first, and that would be ecological isolation. So you've got similar species or populations that are emerging and will later become species, right? Um, you've got similar species that occur in the same area, but they don't encounter one another because of uh, different uses of habitats. So an example of that would be going to the tropical rainforest and you have a species of lizard that lives in the canopy. And yes, lizards do live in the canopy of the tropical rainforest. And you've got its, um, its uh, sister species that's evolving that's down in the, in the dark, wet, dank understory of the tropical forest. They live in different ecosystems. And so, and I realize I'm subdividing a, the rainforest ecosystem into smaller ecosystems. That's fine. We can do that. Um, and we just have these two populations. They are never crossing paths. They never see each other. Some are up in the sunny, bright, dry canopy, and others are down in the understory where it's wet and dark. All right? Ecological isolation. Therefore, those individuals from the canopy and the understory of the forest, they never mate. So it's a prezygotic isolating mechanism. The sperm from one population never makes it to the eggs of another. Okay, another example are of of uh, prezygotic isolating mechanisms would be behavioral isolation. Um, behavioral isolation is when um, the species do not interbreed because they don't share the same behaviors. Typically that involves mating rituals. So I have pictures of these two birds down here at the bottom. Um, they have 
they, they look very, very similar. These birds are so similar, in fact, that the alder and the willow flycatchers are hard for even professional ornithologists and, and the best of the bird watchers to tell them apart in the field. However, if these birds ever open up their mouths and sing, you'll be able to tell the difference. And they use their songs to identify one another in the wild. So the songs are different so that, that the females um, are attracted to the right males. The males are the ones that always do the singing. Okay, So here you've got different behavioral cues keeping the populations separate. Um, females are not going to mate with the other species because they sound differently. Now, other species that might look very similar have different ways of, of doing this. It might not be song. It might be a ritualized courtship dance. A lot of animals do you know, things that are kind of like a dance, and, you know, these displays of moving their bodies and things like that. There's lots of different ways that um, organisms have evolved um, to, to do this kind of thing. And again, this prevents sperm and egg from um, evolving populations or already evolve species from ever coming together. So it's prezygotic. Okay, another form of prezygotic is mechanical isolation. So here we're talking again about sexually reproducing species and because the um, the structure, the, the reproductive structures of one species don't match with the reproductive structure of another species, the sperm and the egg never get together. Um, so I just use this silly example of you can't fit a square peg in a round hole. All right. So really what I'm talking about here is that um, like with um, with vertebrates, um, males and females of different species sometimes cannot mate because the penis of the male is shaped differently um, from the shape of the um, the, the, the reproductive um receptacle. I'm struggling for words because I could say vagina or I could say cloaca depending on the species, not because I'm bashful of saying vagina and cloaca and penis, although I am a little bit, I guess, um, especially with my mom in the other room. But anyway, um, the yeah, basically, um, the, you got to have matching parts in order to mate. And if you don't, then the sperm and egg are not going to get together. Let's move on, shall we? I've embarrassed my enough, myself, myself enough here. Okay. So those were all examples of pre-zygotic. Let's turn now to post-zygotic isolating mechanisms. So in this case, sperm and egg of different populations or different species actually get together, but then it does not lead to a viable um, offspring lineage. Okay, And an example of this is uh, hybridization. Um, in many organisms that are similar enough to, that they can mate, they can overcome the mechanical issues, and the sperm and an egg are carrying DNA that's similar enough that you can actually get an offspring. But the problem is that that offspring is not healthy. It might die young. Um, or if it does live long, it's going to be weak and often, and, and, and also it's going to be sterile. And by sterile, it means it cannot produce eggs or it cannot produce sperm. So an example of this is when zebras mate with horses. You get this thing that's been called a zorse, and you see it on the bottom right. And zorses make it all, you know, they grow to maturity, but they they are actually themselves cannot make um, eggs or they cannot make sperm. So they are an evolutionary dead end. Okay? So hybridization does not always lead to sterility. We'll talk about that, but um, but it usually does. And so if you get a, and that's that winds up being a reproductive isolating mechanism. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, pause here and see if you can answer this question um, to check your, your knowledge so far. Okay, hopefully your choice here was C, that that would be an example of a post-zygotic isolating mechanism. Not sure why, then rewind and watch the last 10 minutes and then try again. Okay, um, so what happens after reproductive isolation is that you have to have genetic divergence. Otherwise, you're just going to have two populations that are separate from one another, but they're actually potentially the same, and they could potentially interbreed. Remember, potential interbreeding is part of the biological species concept that we talked about. Um, so um, if you don't have genetic divergence, then you're just going to wind up having two populations of the same species that just can't interbreed. So 
how does what are we talking about here with genetic divergence? What's going on? Well, all those turns out you already know the answer to this. All those things that we learned about in microevolution, those five different mechanisms that lead to microevolution, well, that causes changes to the DNA of a population over time. And that leads to its genetic distinctiveness. So go back and look at genetic drift. Um, remember population bottleneck effects and also colonizing effects. Um, and also look at natural selection and also look at um, new mutations arising. All, all those mechanisms that we talked about, that's going to lead to, over time, these reproductively isolated populations diverging into new species. Okay? All right, and this is just basically listing what I have on this slide is listing those mechanisms that we saw before. Okay, now um, there are, remember anagenesis and cladogenesis? Anagenesis is the formation of a new species without there being a split in the population. Um, and cladogenesis involves a split in the population. So let's take a look at the two forms of cladogenesis that exist that we know about that can lead to new species. All right, so um, this is just a quick review. You got reproductive isolation and then genetic divergence in order to get um, cladogenesis leading to new species. And here you go with a with an illustration, a cartoon to help illustrate the two forms. The two forms of cladogenesis are allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Patrick refers to, uh, I think it, I should look this up, but I think it refers to like your home country, the place where you live, okay, like, like patriotism, that kind of thing. Um, so sympatric refers to speciation when the two populations in question that become new species, they are actually living side by side. They're living in the same environment, sympatric, sim meaning together. So they're living in the, together in the same environment, and yet they wind up diverging and becoming new species. Allopatric speciation involves some physical separation of the populations that become new species. And that often or, or always involves a geographic barrier, something like a river or an ocean or a chain of mountains or a desert or something like that. Okay. And so that's what you see here illustrated in the uh, illustration at the bottom. This time, time goes from older times at the top to the more modern time at the bottom. And it's comparing the two steps of allopatric and sympatric speciation. So um, in allopatric speciation, starting at the left, you've got a pop. Imagine that this is just, this is just a concept where you're not looking at a it's kind of a concept, the green and the blues and stuff is kind of a concept, and then it's kind of not. I'll, I'll explain as I go along. Um, imagine with allopatric that you've got an area with a, a, a population spread out. Let's say it's an island. Let's say it's a circular island or an oval island, okay? And then there has to be some barrier forming in order to give them a reproductive isolation of the two populations. So let's imagine there's some massive earthquake and the island splits in half and then the snakes on one island can't get to the snakes on the other island because there's ocean in between and they don't swim over the ocean. All right. Now after that earthquake, they are the same species still. They are still, you know, when they're both of the same, they're genetically similar, very similar. Nothing ha has happened. It's just been days or years since the earthquake. But over time, each population adapts to its local environment differently. Maybe one island is drier and one is wetter. Or maybe it's just that females are choosing males that look blue on one side and the other females on the other island just think that the green males are just as beautiful as they ever were. All right. So in isolation, you get the evolution of... Um, these genetically distinct populations and because they become genetically distinct enough um, that enforces that reproductive isolation because when populations get too genetically different from one another then they're not going to be able to mate all right
Now, um, at the very bottom, we sort of see a test of whether, you, at the very bottom of the cartoon, you see a test of whether or not the populations have become separate species. So let's imagine that another earthquake comes along and squeezes those two islands back together to form one island. In that instance, over many generations later, um, if the two populations have actually become separate species, then the blue and the green um, uh, snakes will sort of spread across the island and live side by side, but they won't be mating with one another and sharing genes because they are separate species. They diverged enough to become genetically distinct and so that they can no longer interbreed. Um, that's what was happened during the time when the earthquake had divided the island. Okay, so that's an example of allopatric speciation. Sympatric speciation involves when, and we're talking about the, the chain of uh, green ovals on the right now, sympatric speciation involves where, for reasons we'll talk about in a few minutes, you can get a, um, a distinct population emerging within the main population and then it can spread over time and because they're living together we um, in its sympatric speciation we do not involve a physical barrier separating those species they stop reproducing with each other uh, almost instantaneously um, in that second panel down from the top here we'll go over like how um, how that can work in a few minutes um, traditionally um, it's believed that allopatric speciation is the most common form um, and that sympatric speciation is rare, but I'll present some evidence that sympatric speciation might be a lot more common than we thought, but that'll come later. All right, this is just another cartoon example of allopatric speciation. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this too long. Um, what you're key points in the cartoon at the bottom is that you have on the left you have a you, one population you get a physical barrier like a river the, the beetles can't cross the river on one side of the river the beetles start they genetically diverge and become more green and on the other side they become they stay brown or actually they become lighter brown and then later on the river changes course and the two populations come back together but they stay separate from one another because the enough genetic divergence has occurred that they no longer recognize each other as the same species, and in fact, they cannot mate with each other um, anymore. Now, keep in mind that sometimes geographic barriers will um, come down before the populations diverge enough such that they become separate species. That can happen uh, just by chance. And so these examples that I've been giving you show what leads to completion, where you go from one species to two species over time, but sometimes the whole thing reverses. And one species splits, and it kind of diverges a little bit, but then the barrier comes down, and they wind up um, mushing their populations back together, and they're still just one species. That can happen, too. All right, moving on here. Um, so how do you get sympatric speciation? That's what this question's all about. So since sympatric speciation does not involve a geographic barrier, and for that reason, it's generally thought to be kind of rare because it's hard to imagine why some individuals in a population would instantly stop mating with all other individuals in a population. Um, and that's why for the longest time, biologists thought that sympatric speciation was just conceptually an interesting idea but in actuality was was not very common but it turns out we found a lot of evidence for sympatric speciation when we have started looking at the actual dna of species and not any species um, in um, at random but plants more specifically so let me walk you through this example i gotta i'm gonna do a lot of reading here from the slide because this is kind of some complex stuff even for me okay Polyploidy, hitting you with a new term at the very top there. Ploidy refers, the root ploidy refers to um, chromosomes, okay? Um, you might uh, know this already, but you are a diploid organism. You are, di, di means two, ploid means chromosome. You have one set of chromosomes in your cells from your mom and one set from your dad. So that's two parents contributing 
each one copy of every chromosome, so you are diploid. All right. As normal as that sounds to you and me, turns out some organisms on this planet are um, have more than one copy of each chromosome type. And we refer to those cases as being polyploid. So polyploidy is where you have more than two chromosomes of the same type. Okay? Now, uh, lots, it turns out lots of plant species are polyploid. And polyploidy can allow sympatric speciation. So let me walk you through how that works. So imagine you've got two plant species in the same environment, and they're, they share a common ancestor maybe a couple million years ago. Um, so they're, they're separate species, but genetically they're kind of similar, right? It's like coyotes and wolves. They're obviously very similar to one another, um, and so they're going to share a lot of genes compared to, say, another organism like a bobcat or something like that, right? Okay, so imagine then that these two plants actually um, hybridize. That means they swap genes. Uh, the sperm of one plant make it to the egg of another. So they hybridize. And the hybrids are sterile, just like we saw with the Zorse earlier. But those hybrids actually survive in the environment pretty well because they're different from both parent populations. And so they, they find a new niche where they're actually growing better than any other plants similar plants in the environment. So they actually wind up surviving. So every time the parents um, hybridize, you get more of these hybrids out there in the environment. So the hybrid population sticks around over time. Well, eventually, um, through the process of meiosis, when um, sp sperm and egg are formed, um, there's a malfunction. Okay, And a malfunction leads to um, the a doubling of the chromosome number in the hybrids gamete. So the hybrids are trying to reproduce, they're trying to make sperm and egg, um, and they, they can, but they can't find anybody to mate with because there's like there's um, their their DNA is so different because they're hybrids. But if the hybrids DNA um, like doubles, essentially doubles then and there let me get this right um and then there are enough of them in the population then their gametes that they produce can find the the results of the other hybrids production of offspring and you wind up getting a new species that sort of hatched right then and there so i didn't I kind of stumbled on my explanation of that a little bit. So let's take a look at this. Um, this slide, this will help us out. All right. So we're looking at, um, let's start on the far left here. The two boxes represent two different species, but they're similar enough that they can actually interbreed. Okay. And they hybridize. They're producing their hybrid, ster sterile hybrids. So on the left, you've got um, the two species, and then they're, their egg and the sperm come together and they form in this middle panel here some sterile hybrid offspring. Okay, And um, the offspring have A, B, C, D chromosomes from mom and W, X, Y, Z from the dad. But that's all they got. So there's, there's only one copy of the W chromosome and only one copy of the A chromosome. That's why I draw a little blank here. That's what the line is. It's representing a blank. And so this is one reason why they are um, why they're sterile is that they don't have two copies of every chromosome like their their parents did. So it's kind of they're all kind of messed up genetically. But if you if while they try to make their own sperm and egg, if there's a malfunction in meiosis, then when they they double when they make copies of their chromosomes, the chromosomes actually stay in the gamete. And you wind up having two copies of each chromosome in the gamete. So the gamete isn't haploid, having half the, the DNA of, of the parent. It's actually, it winds up being diploid. So I'm just going to read this paragraph because it's, I think it's well written. You get a malfunction in meiosis within the hybrid, and gamete, created with, and a gamete is created with two copies of each chromosome. 
the gamete itself is viable on its own. So the, the, the parent plant makes this gamete and doesn't need to get that gamete to another plant because guess what? That gamete has all the genetic information it needs in order to survive on its own. So the gamete is viable by itself and the resulting hybrid and the resulting offspring has a complete set of chromosomes. Now these hybrid offspring can out there in the wild as they grow on their own, they can create their own haploid gametes as they go through the process of meiosis, making their own sperm and egg. And those sperm and egg are just normal sperm and egg, except for they've got like the A, B, C, D, W, X, Y, Z chromosomes in each of the gametes that they produce. And so if there are others in the population um, that are also hybrids that have gone through this process, then they can successfully mate. And you've gone from, um, from having two separate plant species that are genetically distinct species in, the, in, the, in, the, in this habitat to now having three, okay? So that's how sympatric speciation can occur. And by looking at the genes of a lot of um, plant species in the world, we realize that up to 50% of plant species might have emerged this way, which is pretty dramatic. Okay, so that's sympatric speciation. What I want to talk about next is looking at um, geographic patterns of speciation. Um, and this is going to rely pretty heavily on examples of, um, of allopatric speciation, where you have a geographic barrier splitting. So adaptive radiation is when you get the evolution of closely related species from a common ancestral species. And that can happen in several situations. For example, when you get a population that, um, that colonizes a new region, such as an island archipelago, um, and then as that population spreads across the islands, each population winds up becoming its own unique species. Another example would be you get, um, after a large cataclysmic event, you wind up getting um, a, pop, a whole open niches in the environment. Um, so for example, after the asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs, there was lots of room for mammals to move into the landscape, and that's exactly what we did. Um, and so we wound up um, colon, like mammals spreading out into all these new environments. Um, and that allowed for uh, um, the formation of lots of new species. Another way that you can get adaptive radiation is when you get a new trait arises in a lineage, in an um, ancestral lineage, and that trait affords the, the individuals that inherit it a really a big advantage over others in the landscape, in the ecosystem, and they wind up expanding into new niches everywhere. So an example of that would be, for example, like if snakes were to evolve a the ability to live in very cold environments so then they start spreading into very cold environments that there had no snakes before and um and so that um that new trait being able to tolerate cold temperatures allowed them to spread out into lots of different areas and uh, in those areas they they adapt to local conditions and become lots of new snake species so in a, you've already seen an example of this, or a, a piece of an example of this, in the Galapagos Islands. When uh, so referred back to the previous, one of the yeah the previous class where I talked about the Galapagos finches, and the Galapagos Islands, of course, are an archipelago. And when um, finches, um, when the first finches arrived in the archipelago from Ecuador. Um, they colonized one of the islands and they s established a successful population. But then over time, some of those finches migrated out to adjacent islands. And in so doing, they colonized those islands. And then they were reproductively isolated from the other islands. And they diverged genetically and became their own species. And now we have, what is this, 13 different species of um they're not all pictured here, but we have 13 different species of Galapagos finches in that archipelago. They all share the same ancestor, a small flock of finches that blew off course probably with a storm, landed on the, in the archipelago and got established, and then over several million years or more spread out across the archipelago. And so today you've got all these finches out there that 
are kind of similar looking but live in very different habitats and use their beaks in very different ways. I'll pull out a couple examples here. Um, you've got one finch that is a vegetarian. It just eats leaves. So it's got this big parrot-like beak, which is really good for picking and, 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 uh, cr and crushing leaf material. You've got one finch that has evolved this little thin bill that's really good for picking out insects. So it's now an insect eater instead of just eating seeds like most finches do. Um, this finch evolved a very long beak, which is really good for um, poking into cactuses and eating the, the plant pulp of a cactus without getting uh, spines um, up in your face because it's got this long beak. And then my favorite of them all is this one, the sharp-beaked ground finch. Little tiny drab-looking guy, but <laughs> what this guy does is he finds large seabirds that are sitting on their nests on the land, and he sneaks up behind them and picks at the back of the bird until they start to bleed and then starts drinking their blood. Let that sink in for a moment. That's right. You were getting bored listening to me talking about birds again deep into this lecture where you thought that you were just going to, it was going to be boring the whole way through. And then I'm telling you that there is a bird that is a vampire. It is true. Go look it up if you don't believe me. Sharp beaks, ground finch. Okay. So all of this is an example of adaptive radiation where one bird species leads to many bird species because they've radiated out into all these different environments and they've used their bill to help them uh, enter in different niches. All right, here's a little uh, test for you to see how well you're doing. Um, go ahead and pause and see if you can answer this correctly. Okay, welcome back. In the process of adaptive radiation, two steps are necessary for speciation in the proper order they are reproductive isolation and genetic divergence. C is your answer here. Okay. <clears throat> now, I told you earlier that there was a third definition for um, what is a species. Um, we've covered the morphological species concept, the biological species concept. Now we're going to talk about some of the problems of the biological species concept and why that has led to the emergence of a new type of um, definition for a species. Here's some of those problems with the biological species concept. Um, remember, here's the definition up at the top in green. Species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. Okay, well here's the first problem. How do you know if populations that are separated by a barrier like an ocean, a desert, a mountain change, how do you know if they potentially interbreed? You can capture them and put them in a cage or something like that, but that's not a really natural situation. I mean, you put any organisms in a cage long enough and something might happen, so that doesn't really, that doesn't really help us out here, okay? Um, that's, so that's a problem with the, with the BSC. A second one is that the biological species concept is completely dependent on defining species that, based on their ability to mate with one another with one another. And, well, if they are an asexually reproducing species, <clears throat> the definition doesn't apply. Um, a third problem is, has to do with plants. A lot of plant species are pretty widely accepted and clearly um, considered separate species, but they can hybridize with one another. Um, like oak trees. Oak trees are notorious for being clearly separate species, but every once in a while, like the two species will produce a, a hybrid offspring that itself is fertile and can produce its own offspring. So it'd be like the horse and the zebra making a zorse that can actually have its own offspring. That does happen um, much more often with plants than animals, and for that reason, the BSC doesn't help us as much with uh, plants. Um, it works much better for, for animals. And then finally, there are these things called species gradients. Once again, another bird example, because birds are the most important and the best organisms on the planet. Um, I'm looking at a bird here called um, a tufted titmouse. No, I'm not making up these names. It is actually called a titmouse. Look it up if you don't believe me. Um, and what you're looking at here on the top right is a is a map showing the five different forms of titmice that occur in North America. And you'll see that they have different forms of, uh, of, of facial patterns and so forth. 
All right. So the two I've got pictured here, one is the bird that's found in the eastern U.S., the tufted titmouse. That's the one you have in your backyards here in town in Alabama or the southeast. And then if you go to the mountains of, um, of um, Arizona, New Mexico, and then down into Mexico, you're going to see the bridal titmouse, uh, which has all this uh, fancy features on its face. Um, very different. Ornithologists have no dispute about this. These two are separate species. They, they are, they're living in very different regions, very different ecosystems, and they look very differently, and they got different songs, etc., etc., etc. But let's check out this example. All right, so here we've got the tufted titmouse in the eastern U.S., and with my cursor, I'm showing you the distribution of another titmouse, the black-crested titmouse. Now, the black-crested titmouse, as you see here, has a black crest, as the name implies, compared to the gray crest on the tufted titmouse, light forehead on the black-crested, dark forehead on the tufted titmouse. And then um, it's hard to see here. Oh, wow. A Cooper's hawk just flew through my parents' yard chasing something and then actually hit the window of their house and then bounced off and flew away. He didn't hit too hard because he could have actually broken the glass. That bird is powerful enough. All the other birds have gone silent. Listen. I don't know if you could have heard it, but before there was like lots of birds chirping in the background. Now everybody's quiet because the Cooper's hawk is a hunter of birds. And that's why he's at the, my parents' bird feeding station here is trying to pick off a bird because he's hungry. Um, and all the other birds are like, okay, nobody move. Everybody be quiet. Cooper's around. Okay, anyway, back to uh, the, the, the example here, the tufted titmice and the black-crested uh, titmouse. Um, the, uh, so what I'm trying to show you here on the, on the map is that the ranges of these two titmice, they overlap here in parts of Texas. And that's made, has, has had for a while uh, scientists um, arguing about whether or not they are separate species or not, because where they overlap, they can actually interbreed. So you've got these distinct forms um, in South Texas and Mexico versus the Eastern tufted titmouse. And otherwise you'd think that they're separate species. But when you go to this one little region here of, of Eastern Texas, they interbreed and it gets kind of confusing. So um, this is, shows again problems of the biological species concept. We've got genetically distinct populations but we're not sure what to do with this because the biological species concept would say that they are all the same species. Okay, what we're looking at here is what's called a, a typological concept problem where we're trying to put things into categories, discrete categories. And in reality, um, it's just not that simple. In reality, genetic variation is a continuum in both time and through space. So imagine um, in cladogenesis where you get a population that is split and those two populations are diverging from one another genetically. Well, at what point in time do you say that they are different enough to call them separate species? That can be hard to say. Um, in terms of space, um, you have the, the problems like I just showed you on the graph um, with the intermediate forms in the middle. Otherwise, they look like they're separate species. So trying to fit things into categories like that is a problem with this, with this species concept. So the new concept that has arisen is called the phylogenetic species concept. Okay, phylogenetic refers to phylogeny, which is a method of classifying species apart from one another based on their relatedness and based on their genes. So the phylogenetic species concept looks at the genetic distinctiveness of populations. And if they're genetically distinct enough, and we can sometimes see scientists arguing over how much is enough, but if they're distinctive enough, we just call them separate species. So in the previous example of the tit mice, we'd say, yep, we got two species. Nope, no problem. They can interbreed where they overlap, but they're genetically distinct enough. We're going to call them separate species. Okay. The phylogenetic species concept has been around probably about two decades now. It's not in; it's becoming increasingly accepted, um, but it's a little bit problematic because it means that we've got a lot more species on this planet than we were counting before. That means a lot more species we've got to keep track of, 
and it means a lot more small isolated populations that are vulnerable to extinction which means that we got to work even harder to keep these populations around so that they don't disappear to extinction caused by humans all right oh my gosh we're finally done so that's a that's a wrap for macro evolution um, bring your questions to to class time so um, I can go over some things again um, that um, that were a little bit muddy there for you I know that um, I'm working in kind of a, a difficult environment here to concentrate so uh, I might not have been as clear as I normally am on some other things all right so um, see you guys in class take care